Welcome to four short recorded lectures about macronutrient digestion and absorption. This one will be about carbohydrates. My goal is for you to be able to visualize what happens when we eat a meal, such as this pizza, which has this nutrient composition, to having these major macronutrients available to the cells of our body. Recall that uh, the three major classes of macronutrients are the fats or lipids, carbohydrates, primarily glucose, fructose, and galactose, and proteins and amino acids. So the rest of this lecture will all be focused on the carbohydrates. In each of these recorded lectures, I'll have some practice questions. You may want to pause the video in order to uh, spend a moment answering these questions to yourself. So the first of them is this. What macronutrients can you uh, describe here in this pizza. If we start with the lipids, the primary one will be triacylglycerols, or fat itself, uh, that you can see in the shiny oils, um, the cheese, the pepperoni, and small amounts elsewhere. Uh, there'll also be some cholesterol. Cholesterol comes in foods that come from animals. The pepperoni and the cheese will have cholesterol. Next, if we look at the carbohydrates, the, the crust is largely starch, coming from wheat in this case. Um, uh, there'll also be some lactose, milk sugar, in the um, cheese, uh, as well as some fructose and some sucrose that will be in the vegetables, the tomatoes, etc. And lastly, those proteins. Uh, largely in the cheese and the pepperoni. Um, there's also small amounts of protein that's in the pizza crust. For example, gluten is a protein. Uh, and the fruits and vegetables, the vegetables here, will have small amounts of protein. This table gives a rough estimate of what we consume on a daily basis. For the rest of this video, uh, we'll be talking about the carbohydrates here at the top. And the next slide shows the structure of several of these. Here's the chemical structure of several of the most common dietary carbohydrates. On the top is shown starch, the two main components of starch, which is uh, starch is made completely of polymers of glucose. There's uh, this unbranched amylose. Notice that it, they're very long chain as well as some um, occasionally branched amylopectin. But again, it's all glucose. Sucrose, or table sugar, is a disaccharide of glucose and fructose, whereas lactose is a disaccharide of galactose and glucose. The previous slide showed that the carbohydrates that we eat are primarily polymers of sugars or disaccharides, and yet it's only the monosaccharides that can be absorbed in, into our intestinal enterocytes. So, question, what must happen to these carbohydrates that we eat as part of chemical digestion? Answer, these polymers and disaccharides must be hydrolyzed to their monosaccharides. Lactase, hydrolyzes lactose, and note it is a beta-galactosidase, okay, defined by this beta linkage, and that the first sugar is galactose, and it hydrolyzes the lactose to galactose and glucose. Sucrase, on the other hand, is an alpha-glucosidase. Note that sucrase is glucose-linked alpha to fructose, and the alpha has to do with the orientation of this bond. And sucrase um, digests the sucrose to one molecule of glucose and one molecule of fructose. So what happens when we eat a meal that contains some carbohydrates? Uh, first, what is not shown in this diagram is that the salivary glands in the mouth secrete an enzyme called amylase, which begins breaking down the starch. However, this is only really significant if we chew our foods for a long time. Those of us who wolf down our foods, uh, that starch enters the stomach mostly undigested. So we have the starch, sucrose, lactose, um, 
breakdown products of starch called maltose, etc., that enter the stomach and not much happens to them in the stomach. Then in the small intestine, pancreatic amylase plays a major role in digesting the starch, in hydrolyzing it down to uh, largely disaccharides like maltose and isomaltose. So those disaccharides, there may also be some trisaccharides in there, they proceed uh, into, through the small intestine where there are um, the brush border enzymes, maltase, sucrase, and lactase, which digest these to the monosaccharides of glucose, fructose, and galactose, shown here, which can enter the intestinal enterocytes and enter the portal vein. There are several sugar transporters on the brush border or luminal surface of the intestinal enterocytes, shown here. Together, they ensure that essentially 100% of monosaccharides in the small intestine end up getting absorbed into the enterocytes. These monosaccharides then largely exit on the basal lateral membrane through the GLUT2 transporter and on their way to the uh, portal venous system that goes to the liver. Recall that a healthy small intestine has an enormous surface area that is maximized for nutrient absorption. Remember that there are macrovilli, the structures shown here, which are composed of many, many epithelial enterocytes, so we're blowing up a region here, and on the surface of each one of those epithelial cells, there are numerous microvilli. So together, this makes an enormous surface area. And I'm just showing you the surface area by comparison of a football field. Um, the human small intestine has a larger surface area, if it's healthy, than a football field. But what happens if one of these carbohydrate digestive enzymes is missing or malfunctioning? Or if there's a problem with the small intestine, such that it loses its surface area? If this happens, then polysaccharides, disaccharides, and monosaccharides end up proceeding through the small intestine to the large intestine. And you know that the large intestine, the colon, is full of bacteria, and bacterial fermentation occurs. Now, there's always bacterial fermentation occurring, largely with the fibers, the soluble fibers that we eat. Uh, but if we have a problem with digestion or absorption of carbohydrates, this will occur uh, in excess. And so what's the result of bacterial fermentation? Well, you can see on the left-hand side, there's a bunch of gases that can be produced. Hydrogen gas, carbon dioxide, methane, and uh, hydrogen sulfide, some rather stinky gas. Uh, additionally, fermentation can produce several um, short-chain fatty acids, the 2-carbon acetate, the 4-carbon butyrate, and the 3-carbon propionate. Uh, note also that some bacteria can produce a small amount of ethanol in our intestine, which is um, in the colon, which is rapidly absorbed and metabolized. So let's quickly summarize what happens with carbohydrate digestion and absorption. First, usually not a whole lot occurs uh, until the small intestine, where pancreatic amylase is very important for digesting starch down to oligosaccharides and disaccharides. These are um, hydrolyzed down to the monosaccharides by the intestinal brush border glycosidases, maltase, sucrase, and lactase till we get to these monosaccharides, which are absorbed by several transporters on the intestinal enterocytes and get transported through to the portal system. Now, if any of this does not occur, then we have uh, oligosaccharides, polysaccharides, and monosaccharides continuing on to the colon, where excessive bacterial fermentation occurs. These last few slides contain written summary statements. I will not read them to you. Feel free to look through them on your own. I hope that you found this short lecture to be helpful.